बोले न बोलो रे बंधन भोरे बसे चलोर राखी सारी रसा जे हे मान दुर्गा मान बजे हयकी खोरो पावन के
Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jayamudhirayat Nasta Praeshu Vabhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke 
Bhakti nice to keep. <coughs> We're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, Chapter number 16, entitled Maharaj Chitraketu Meets the Supreme Lord. Text number 10. Na hi asyasti priya kaschin na priya swa paropiva eka sarva diyam drasta katrinam Gunadoshayo Nayas Yasti Priyakaschin Nayas Yasti Priyakaschin Na Katrinam gunadoshayo Nahyasti priyakaschin Napriyaswa paropiva Ekasarvatiyam drashta Katrinam gunadosh ayo Nahyasyasti priya kaschin Napriya svaparopiva Ekasarva diyam drashta Katrinam gunadoshayo Nahyasyasti priya kaschin drashta Katrinam gunadoshayo Nahi yashyasti priya kaschin Nahi yashyasti priya diyam drashta Katrinam gunadoshayo Nahi asyasti priya kaschin Napriya svagropiva Ekasarvadiyam drashta Katridam gunadoshayo Okay. Na, not, he, indeed, asya, to the living entity, asti, there is, priya, dear, kaschit, someone, na, not, apriya, not dear. Swa, own, para, other, api, also, va, or, eka, the one, sarvadiyam, of the varieties of 
intelligence. Drashta, the seer. Kartrinam, of the performers. Gunadoshayo, of right and wrong activities. Translation, for this living entity no one is dear nor is anyone unfavourable. He makes no distinction between that which is his own and that which belongs to anyone else. He is one without a second. In other words, he is not affected by friends and enemies, well-wishers or mischief mongers. He is only an observer, a witness of the different qualities of men. Purport by Śrīla Prabhupāda As explained in the previous verse, the living entity has the same qualities as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but he has them in minute quantities because he is a small particle, sakshma, whereas the Supreme Lord is all-pervading and great. For the Supreme Lord there are no friends, enemies, or relatives, for he is completely free from all the disqualifications of ignorance that characterize the conditioned souls. On the other hand, he is extremely kind and favorable to his devotees, and he is not at all satisfied with persons who are envious of his devotees. As the Lord himself confirms in Bhagavad Gita 9.29, Samo ham sarvabhuteshu name dvishosti napriya ye bhajanti tu mam bhakta mai te teshu chapyaham. I envy no one, nor am I partial to anyone. I am equal to all, but whoever renders service unto me in devotion is a friend, is in me, and I am in him. I am also a friend to him. The Supreme Lord has no enemy or friend, but he is inclined towards a devotee who always engages in his devotional service. Similarly, elsewhere in the Gita 16, 19, the Lord says, Tamaham dvishata kruran samsareshu naradhamam shipami ajashram ashrujam asurish eva yonishu those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, are cast by me into the ocean of material existence, into the various demonic species of life. The Lord is extremely antagonistic towards those who are envious of his devotees. To protect his devotees, the Lord sometimes has to kill their enemies. For example, to protect Prahlad Maharaj, the Lord had to kill his enemy Haranyakashipu. Although Haranyakashipu attained salvation because of being killed by the Lord. Since the Lord is the witness of everyone's activities. He witnesses the actions 
of the enemies of his devotees and he, he is inclined to punish them. In other cases, however, he simply witnesses what the living entities do and gives the result of one's sinful or pious activities. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurunilitan Yena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakalpa Terubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We're hearing how the, the, the son of Chitraketu had been brought back to life by the mystic power of Narada Muni and how that young boy began to speak philosophy. On being brought back to life, he began to speak transcendental knowledge to his lamenting father. Maharaj Chitraketu was feeling very pained to see the death of his son. It was unbearably painful for him. So Narada Muni arranged that the dead child would come back just for some time and explain the nature of the material body and the living entity. So. We heard in the previous verse how the living entity is distinct from the Supreme Lord. Although they're one in the sense that they're both spiritual and they're both in the heart, but still there's a difference. And the difference is that the living entity is very small and the Supreme Lord is all-pervading. Infinite, everywhere. So, today we're hearing how the living entity makes no distinction between his own and that which belongs to someone else. He makes no distinction between friends and enemies. He makes no distinction between what is favorable and what is unfavorable. This kind of thinking that I like this, I don't like that, that this is good but that is bad, this is all the nature of the mind. And we have to learn to transcend the mind. So the living entity, the spirit soul within the body is a pure, it's pure. It's not subject to the illusions of the mind. The mind is always thinking about things and considering things in different ways. We become influenced by the, the mind not but so much by the actual situation, but we are influenced by the mind. For one person, situation is very nice, and for another person, the situation may be very bad. What's the difference? Just simply their minds perceive the situation in a different way. So, the living entity has to overcome the influence of the mind and the living entity, well the living entity is 
transcendental to the mind. And we have to learn not to hear the mind, but to take knowledge from the higher authority. From, we should take knowledge from ultimately from the super soul in the heart, the Supreme Lord who's in our heart. And we take knowledge also from Sadhu Shastra and Guru. So we have these authorities to guide us. We don't just depend on the mind. It's not a good idea. We have to transcend the mind. So the Lord has a special relationship for those who are his devotees. So this point is explained in the Bhagavad Gita. It's explained Lord Krishna is speaking to Arjuna and he is saying he, he he's not partial to people. He sees everyone equally. But he has a special favor for his devotees. So of course this, uh, in, when we first hear this, we, we think, well this is contradictory. He's saying he likes devotees, but he's saying he's equal to everyone. So he's not equal to everyone. But Srila Prabhupada explains to us that no, he said, he, Prabhupada gives the example, he said, just like if you go to a court of law. Now in the court of law, someone may come in the court and the judge may reward him. He may have been hit by a car and the car driver was reckless and the person got hit, he got badly injured. So he came to court and the court awarded the person compensation. That this driver was reckless and irresponsible, he's injured you, he should pay you money because you've been badly injured, you haven't been able to work, so your life was put into so many difficulties, so this man must pay you compensation. And so the man feels, you know, okay, I'm getting compensation. And then the next person comes into court and he's a criminal and he done even murder. And the judge sentenced him, you go to you're going to be hung by the neck till you're dead. So the the person who's to be hung, he says to the judge, he said, Hey, just a minute. The other man came to court, you gave him a lot of money, and you said, why are you going to hang me? Well, they just said, well, everyone gets the results of their work. You have to be punished for what you've done. That other man was given compensation for what happened to him. It was no fault of his own, so he's given compensation. But you are responsible for what you did. You have to be punished. And the proper punishment for your crime is death. You should be hung by the neck. The man, the criminal may say, well, this is not fair. You're not part. You're, you're being partial. You like him. You don't like me. And you should be equal to everyone. But the judge says, no, everyone gets the results of their activities. As you sow, so shall you reap, it says in the Christian Bible. In other words, if you sow seeds of melons, you will harvest melons. And if you sow seeds of beans, you will harvest beans. Right? That's a Chinese thing. That you sow beans, you harvest beans. No, so the same way, you do bad things, you get bad results, you get punished. You do good deeds, or you do something which is pleasing, you get rewarded for it. So the Lord is not partial, but He's particularly inclined to His devotees. And Srila Prabhupada explains, He said, this is natural.
for opposing the devotees. Just like a Hindu Prabhupada gives the example, Harani Kashi Pu was, terror, was torturing and terrorizing Prahlad and threatening to kill Prahlad. So the Lord came as Lord Nishringadev. We see also Lord Chaitanya was ready to kill Jagai and Madhai because they injured Lord Nityananda. But Lord Nityananda appealed to Lord Chaitanya that in this age, in the Kali Yuga, must be merciful. In other ages, the Lord would certainly kill the demons and the Rakshasas. Paritranaya sadhunam vinas chaya chaduskritam. The Lord comes to give pleasure to his devotees and to annihilate the miscreants. So who are these miscreants? Those who are terrorizing, giving trouble to the devotees. The Lord comes to, to take care of them, stop them from giving trouble to his devotees. So we understand how the Lord is very personal in his dealings. He is Bhakta Vatsala. He is not Karma Vatsala or Jnana Vatsala, but he is Bhakta Vatsala. He reciprocates with the pure love of his devotees. He does not reciprocate with the Jnani who has a lot of knowledge, and he does not reciprocate with the Karmi, the fruit of worker but he does have a special affection for his devotees. He likes to... He likes to deal with his devotees and he's concerned for the welfare of his devotees. As he says in the Bhagavad Gita, Kuntiya pritijani he nami bhakta prinashati the Lord says, my devotee will never perish. And the Lord doesn't just say it himself, but he requests Arjuna to say it. He wants Arjuna to say it because the Lord sometimes he is known to break his promise. Sometimes Lord Krishna will give a promise and he will break his promise. Just like he promised he wouldn't fight in the Kurukshetra war. But he fought when it was necessary, when Arjuna's life was in danger, then Lord Krishna was prepared to fight, to come forward. Just like Grandfather Bhishma at one point was coming ready to kill Arjuna. Arjuna's chariot had become uh, in the damage, and the wheel would come off the axle, and Arjuna was in difficulties, and Bhishma was coming ready to kill Arjuna. So at that point, seeing the danger to his devotee, Lord Krishna came forward and picked up the chariot wheel and threatened Bhishma. And in this way, Grandfather Bhishma surrendered and did not kill Arjuna. So this was an example of Krishna breaking his promise. Although he promised he would not fight, he did fight. So Lord Krishna is not bound by moral principles, but he is more bound by his love for his devotee. He has that loving feeling for his devotees. And that this is why devotees sacrifice everything for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. That they'll give up everything for Lord Krishna. There's nothing they would want to hold on to if it's going to restrict their love to Krishna. They want to simply be engaged in the service of Krishna. And Krishna is conquered by that mood of devotion. It is only devotion which is attractive to Krishna. 
as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, in the Bhakti Mama Vijanati Yabhamnyas Chasmin Tapata. Only by devotion can I be understood. Only by devotion can the devotees come to me. That feeling of devotion, that is what attracts the heart of Lord Krishna. And we want to develop that mood of devotion through the activities of bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga is engaging all the senses, the mind and body, all in the service of Lord Krishna. We want to utilize the senses. These senses are actually the property of Krishna. They're meant for Krishna's service. We're meant to use the senses for Krishna's service. Just like we use our eyes to see the beauty of the deity. We use our ears to hear the glories of the Lord from the scriptures. We use our tongue to chant his holy name and to taste the prasad. We use our legs to walk to the temple and to dance in the kirtan. All of our different senses and bodily limbs can be used for the service of Lord Krishna. And when we use the senses in the service of Krishna, then we transcend the material nature. We become free from that bondage to birth and death. So the living entity is describing to Maharaj Chitra Ketu the nature of the living entity, the, the soul. That this Maharaj Chitra Ketu was in the bodily concept of life. He was thinking, my son, just like the parents will think, my child. We think in terms of the body. But actually, who is that child? Your wife may give birth to a child, but in a previous life, that child was some other person's child or was in another family. Now they've come into your family. And in the future, they will also go, or we will also go. So that bodily relationship, that is very temporary. And that is, sometimes Prabhupada would refer to it as skin disease. Skin disease. We are thinking, my, my skin, my, my family, my relatives. This is all the bodily conception of life. So Srimad Bhagavatam tells us uh, that if we think we're this body, which is just a bag of three elements, right? The body is compared to a bag. And in the bag, three elements, mucus, bile, and air, or kapha, pitta, and vayu. So anyone who thinks they are in this body, then they're like a foolish animal, like a cow or an ass. Just like the cow or the ass, they cannot understand their spiritual identity. In the same way, if we're thinking, I am this body, which is just the bag of stool and blood and bones with the, all, with the elements of kapha, pit and vayu, then we are no different from the foolish animal. So Krishna consciousness is meant to bring us out of the bodily concept of life. It's meant to bring us to the transcendental platform where we're no longer identifying with the flesh or with the body, where we're identifying ourselves as a spiritual being, 
And as spiritual beings, we have an eternal relationship with Lord Krishna. And we nourish that relationship with Lord Krishna by engaging in bhakti yoga, particularly hearing and chanting. And in this way we water the root, the roots of the creeper of devotion. Just as we water the plant, we have to water the roots of our bhakti lata beach. The bhakti lata beach, the seed of devotion, has been planted in the heart. Chaitanya Charitamrita describes Brahmanda Brahmite Konya Bhagyavanji Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhakti Lata Beach. By great fortune, we have contacted the devotee who has given us a seed of devotion, the Bhakti Lata Beach the seed of the creeper of devotion. Konya Bhagyavanji, the living entity becomes fortunate when they get that seed of devotion. So that seed of devotion has come to us and we have to nourish it, we have to water it, we have to allow that creeper to grow. And by nourishing the creeper of devotion, we can develop our attraction for Lord Krishna. The attraction for Krishna will come about through the process of bhakti yoga, by regularly hearing and chanting. At the same time, we have to always guard against the anarthas, the unwanted things which restrict the growth of the creeper of devotion. The uh, obstacles in growing the creeper of devotion come in the form of offenses. And these offenses can be in the form of seva apara where we're doing devotional service, particularly we may be worshipping the deity. So in the process of deity worship, there may be some offenses committed, which will obstruct the growth of our creeper. It may be nam aparat, in, the, in our chanting of the holy name, we may be committing offenses in our chanting, and that will also restrict the growth of our creeper of devotion. And it, uh, another kind of offense which may be there may come in the form of uh, Vaishnav Aparat, offending the devotees. We have to be very cautious in dealing with the devotees because the devotees are dear to Lord Krishna and if we have problem, if we may have uh, interactions with the devotees which are harsh or rough or without proper etiquette, we may offend the devotees and those offenses this is, this is like the number one offense in the chanting of the Holy Name. This is described as the uh, Hatimata Apara, the mad elephant offense. And it can destroy all the creeper of the devotion. So there are different anarthas to be avoided. There's, there's problems due to offenses then there's also problems due to material desires. That in the course of our devotional service, we may be keeping a lot of material desires in our heart. And we have to remove these things from the heart. We have to be constantly checking 
to see how much are we getting free of material desires. How much are we becoming more attached to Krishna and Krishna's service. That should be our mood in cultivating the devotion to Krishna. That we want to give ourselves completely to Krishna. We want to absorb our, our, ourselves in the service of Krishna. Of course, for most people, conditioned souls, we have to also live in the material world. So it said, it's like a train on two tracks. One track is the material life, and the other track is the spiritual life. So you want to keep the two tracks level. You don't want the tracks to become unbalanced, because then the train can easily turn over. So we want to make sure we proceed carefully. If we're too much attached to the material and no spiritual practice, then that's not good. And if we try to go too quickly onto the spiritual path without fully detaching ourselves from the material, then that is also a problem. So we have to proceed with caution under the guidance of sadhu, shastra and guru, we have to progress. We have to chant, we have to hear, we have to do service, and at the same time, we have to live in the material world. You have to work, you may have responsibilities, you have commitments, you have family members, we have to think of these different duties and at the same time remember Krishna. So balance of Krishna consciousness. It's a fine balance. And difficult. It's a challenge. Most people to balance their material life with their spiritual life. But, with the help of Krishna, the grace of Krishna can be done. Just like we see devotees live nearby the temple, live near the temple, then it's very convenient to come to temple regularly. If you live too far away from the temple, it's a problem. You don't get regular association. So when you're far away from the temple, then you have to be more cautious to do good sadhana. Maybe you have to have your own deity, and you have to regularly hear the classes, and so on. I mean, there are devotees, they're very regular. There are people hearing just now. Yesterday morning we were giving class, and yesterday afternoon a marriage came, and she was telling me about the class. I was surprised. I said, how did you, you were not in the class. I said, no, I hear every morning. Every morning I hear the class. So the devotees like that, you see. This is the benefit of the, the technology today. We make use of technology to help us remember Krishna. That's the idea. We must remember Krishna. So even though we may not be in the temple, we could be hearing, you could be seeing the deity worship. If you go mayapur.com, you can see Mongol Arti, you can see the deity greetings and everything. And it's very popular. Mayapur, we've got the biggest audience to witness the Mongol Arti. So, like that, but we have to adjust our life so that we can remember Krishna. Okay, Hare Krishna, any comment? Yes, Prabhu Vishnu Prabhu? Uh, the question, um, you quote the verse from the Amitara Dhamrita, Brahmanda Brahmita, I'll say it again in the mic. 
Uh, you quoted the verse from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Brahmanda Brahmite Kono Bhagyavan Ji uh, Bhagyavan means fortunate, but by good fortune, uh, a living entity comes in contact with a uh, guru, uh, guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhakti Lata Bhishadadi. By good fortune, he comes in contact with Guru. What is that good fortune? Is it, is it some kind of, um, you know, other power that determines? I mean, is it just like a potluck, or, or what is that? Well, it may simply be the costless mercy of the pure devotee. The pure devotees are very merciful that they they will give Krishna Consciousness, they will distribute Krishna Consciousness wherever they go. So fortunate souls will take advantage of that association, that opportunity to get the Bhakti Lata Beach, right? They're giving that seed of devotion. They're putting these drops of nectar into, on, onto people. And so that they become attracted to Krishna consciousness. So how what qualifies one for that? There's no qualification. There's nothing we could do which could ever qualify us to get that mercy. It's really the causeless mercy of the pure devotee. That the devotees themselves are causelessly merciful. And they give Krishna consciousness without discriminating. Practically, they don't discriminate who is worthy and who is not worthy. They'll go everywhere, give everyone the chance to hear the holy name, to take prasadam. Of course, in the purport we read today, Prabhupada quotes a verse from chapter 16 where Lord Krishna describes that those people who are demoniac and envious, that he puts them into demonic species of life, birth after birth. So there are people of that particular nature who are very demoniac and very envious, so the body will avoid, we will want to avoid these kind of people, we want to stay away from because if we go to them, they will simply become more offensive. They will simply increase their anger and their envy. So rather than giving them the opportunity to be more angry, we just simply avoid them. So there is some discrimination there. And the Lord himself arranges for these people by putting them into the lower species of life. And the lower species of life, you know, nasty dogs sometimes, you know, and snakes and reptiles and scorpions, and we, you know, we don't try to give Krishna consciousness usually to these kind of creatures. Although sometimes there may be some great souls who may do it. You know, we, we hear, for example, Narada Muni had a snake who was a disciple, and he told the snake, don't bite anybody. And there's a, also that story about the two sadhus, and how one sadhu picked up a scorpion that was drowning in water, and he picked up the scorpion and when he picked up the scorpion, it bit him. And so when it bit him, he dropped it and fell back in the water. So he picked it up again. But when he picked it up again, again it bit him. And again he dropped it and fell back in the water. So he was going to pick it up again. And his friend said to him, he said, why, why are you worrying about it? It bites you. Every time you pick it up, it bites you. Why are you worrying about it? But his friend said to him, he said, well, he does not give up his nature. Why should I give up my nature? 
My nature is to be compassionate and to try to save her. Why I should give up my nature? So there are great souls <laughs> like that, not, not very common to have that compassionate nature, but there are sometimes these kind of souls who will accept uh, all kinds of difficulties to try to give Krishna consciousness, to try to deliver souls from the most hellish conditions. Just like Srila Prabhupada went into all kinds of hellish conditions, you know, he went to a hippie communes and different places to deliver Krishna consciousness. So that is causeless mercy. Yes. Maharaj, uh, can you tell me what is the reaction of the husband needs his wife or the wife needs the husband? Um, sometimes wives are more powerful than us. <laughs> anyway, uh, or someone who beats devotees, what is the reaction? Well, the laws of karma are there. You beat someone in the future, someone will come and beat you. They will come back to you. You get reactions. You, as you sow, so shall you reap. So you're showing a lot of anger and violence to someone. In the in the, so later somebody else will be violent, you know, will come back to you. You won't escape from the, the reactions of these kind of things. So devotees are particularly very cautious with anger. Why do people be their anger? So anger is one of the gates into hell. There are three gates to hell, lust, anger, and greed. So anger is one of these three gates which, you know, you're going into hell, hellish life. You're angry to someone, you beat someone, in the future you beat somebody, in the future you try to beat other people, and then the few other people will come and beat you, it will come back to you. The laws of material nature are very rigid. They grind very fine. You cannot escape. You may escape the law of the state. You may break the, the laws of the state. But you cannot go against the laws of the Supreme Lord. And if you do harm and uh, beat someone, in the future you'll be beaten will come back to you. Next question, one more question. Uh, like uh, Ma Maharaj was talking about the scorpion. So he picked up the scorpion and the scorpion beat him. So I was watching this YouTube of how these uh, conservationists, when they pick up an animal, they make sure that they pick it up in such a way that they, they don't get beaten or uh, hurt by an animal. So maybe if we want to help somebody, we should, I mean, in my, if we want to help somebody, we should help them, but make sure you don't, uh, in such a way that, I mean, there's another way that maybe you can take a stick and put in the scorpion up instead of picking it up on that. So, from what I understand, we should help somebody, but make sure we don't get, uh, hurt or beaten by them. Because we know their nature, we help them. Actually, there's a, there's a soldier who was supposed to kill Hitler and Hitler back, forgiveness, uh, back, uh, back him, please don't kill me. So he did not kill Hitler. And then Hitler became the Prime Minister of Germany. So if he had Get it right, you know, Master. History will have changed. Mm. Yes, yes, your point is valid. We should be careful how we deal with people. We try to help them. 
you have to be sure <laughs> that you can do it without getting too much uh, caught up in their own problems. <laughs> Just like doctors, they work sometimes they work in hospitals. Like I heard doctors in New York City, but that so often they get patients coming. You know, patients are maybe on drugs or alcohol or something, and they're trying to treat them and try to take care of their wounds, their injuries, and they, the patient will try to beat them and hit them. So being a doctor, you risk like that, you know, the patient is hit, hitting the doctor. The doctor's trying to treat, but the patient's trying to hit. So some, they, they have to tie the arms of the patient, you know, to stick, restrict them, to stop them being violent. So when then we want to help people, sometimes you maybe go to a family affair, a problem, a hot big quarrel between husband and wife, you, you don't want to get involved. Better to stay out. Don't get involved in it. You know, this their own affair, their private affair. You go and get involved in it, trying to deal with the husband and wife, you may they'll, they'll both hate you. They both turn against you. Yeah. So better to just stay away and leave them, let them take care of it themselves. Okay, Hare Krishna.